so you can be working to build uh, cooperatives, uh, worker-owned enterprises, uh, localism in agriculture and food production and so on, at the same time that you're pressing Congress to pass legislation that will enable us to survive. Uh, it's not a matter of one or the other. You have to make judgments at each point about what's more important tomorrow. But both both of these parallel efforts have to be carried out constantly. The old world is ending. And we have the opportunity to rethink everything. This is a show about the systemic problems in our world. And the real solutions we have today. To transition from an apocalyptic storm of war, scarcity, and ecological collapse. To create an abundantly advanced collaborative society. That sustains all life. You may think it's an impossible dream. But the alternative is an inevitable nightmare. We're your hosts, Matt Holton, Amanda Smith, and Zachary Marlowe. And together, we can move past this economic absurdity and come together to actualize our collective potential to create something completely new. We are Mindless Society. Society. I want to start out with a question I've wanted to ask you for a really long time, and it's basically that you've been right for a very long time. You've been speaking out against this injustice, and you've had so much science and data and information and just correct information. I've personally never seen you just be flat out wrong, and I've seen you at every point in American history pretty much for the past 50 plus years speaking out against the things that are going wrong. So the simple question for me is, how is it that somebody like you and that so many other people like you can be just right and correct and have the truth on their side and things still don't change? I don't think that's quite true. I think there's been a lot of improvement over the years, not because of me, but because of people like you. Uh, young people, mostly activists, have changed, civilized the country and the society quite considerably. You look back at what the world was like 50 years ago, a lot of what was taken for granted then would be intolerable now. It's because of the committed activism of mostly young people, some others over the years, with regard to human rights, civil rights, women's rights, aggression, nuclear weapons, uh, much has changed. It's a much more civilized society and country because of people who just haven't given up and keep working. Can you describe the interconnected uh, nature of our corporate system, how the state, the market, the empire, and the economy are really all one entity? They're not all separate things. Well, there's a very... We can go back to someone I like to quote 250 years ago, Adam Smith, at the beginning, early stages of the capitalist, cap, modern capitalist system. He pointed, he was talking about England, of course. He said in England, the masters of mankind, the merchants and manufacturers, are the principal architects of government policy. And they make sure that their own interests are very well taken care of, however grievous the effect on others. And he went on to talk about the savage injustice of England, the Europeans generally, in the colonized world. Things haven't changed that much since. That's still the best simple account of the questions that you asked that I know of. And it's, uh, it's not the usual way in which Adam Smith is portrayed, but that was his insight. I think it's quite accurate. And now it isn't merchants and manufacturers, it's multinational corporations, huge financial institutions, but they still have even more today overwhelming uh, influence and domination over affairs of state. And they uh, shape them as much as they can for their own interests, however grievous the effect on others by today. It's much more serious. 
So when uh, yesterday, for example, the fossil fuel companies uh, announced their uh, quarterly profits, which are going into the stratosphere, it's profits for them and the banks that lend to them and so on. And they're also planning for uh, decades more of expansion and profit making. They know perfectly well that they're driving us to destruction. But however grievous the effect on the population, doesn't matter. They're following what Adam Smith called their vile maxim, all for ourselves, nothing for anyone else. Doesn't matter how much is damaged as long as we profit. And going back to your question, this is not a personal uh, fault of theirs. It's an institutional problem. If you don't pursue the vile maxim, you're not in the game anymore. That's the nature of the institutions. So you can work hard consciously to destroy the prospects for life on earth. And when you look in the mirror, you can say, what else can I do? If I don't do it, somebody else will do it and I'm out of business. It's an institutional problem. It's called capitalism. If production is for profit, not for need, and it's under the control of concentrated private control, where most people are subordinated to the labor contract, which means you essentially spend your life, your waking life, uh, renting yourself to a private master. That structure is, of course, going to lead to efforts on the part of private capital and the states that they dominate to try to maximize capital accumulation, whatever the effect on others. And in this case, the effect is on towards destruction. That's only one aspect. Another aspect is expanding domination of the world for these interests. Leads to war, conflict. In the modern period, since 1945, means possibly terminal war, because we've developed the a technology that enables us to develop everything unless it's held under control. And that's all of that is right before our eyes. That's why a couple of days ago, the Bulletin of Atomic Scientists moved the hands of their famous doomsday clock to 90 seconds to midnight, midnight's termination. It's the closest it's ever been in 77, 75 years. Can you talk about how the sort of divide between the you know state and market that people perceive is is basically an illusion and that the political system that is essentially supposed to protect us from capital and regulate things is actually a component of that system that enriches and enforces its its will well there's an ideology which claims that we're committed to market societies and what's called free enterprise Free enterprise is the euphemism for capitalist control, uh, but that's very far from true. Uh, the, uh, all, the business has always called upon the state to protect itself from the ravages of the market. The general population is to be thrown out into the market to survive somehow, but not the rich and powerful. Uh, they call on the state. In the neoliberal period, the last 40 years, which have been described as a deep commitment to the market, we've moved to what's been sometimes called by economists a uh, bailout economy. If corporations get into trouble, the friendly taxpayer comes in and bails them out. Uh, furthermore, the government provides guarantees uh, that allow financial institutions and others to take risky inv investments, great profit, knowing that they'll be uh, bailed out if they get into trouble. It's, uh, um, it's increased substantially since the Reagan years, since the doors were thrown open, regulation was declined. So you go back to the early post-war period, there 
no financial crises, starting with Reagan right away. Financial crisis crashes one after another all over the world as it becomes moves into this system. You move into the market systems. Yes, there are crashes and disruption. The state, which is largely dominated by private capital, moves in to save those uh, the worthy ones, those who own things. You see, this doesn't. It's it's, it's you can see it very dramatically in crisis cases. So in 2008, 2009, there was a major recession. Uh, George Bush's administration, his Congress passed uh, legislation, TARP legislation, to uh, uh, overcome the, to prevent the recession from coming into depression by massive government funding. Obama took it over, expanded it, and implemented it. Had two components. One component was to bail out the perpetrators of the crisis, the banks, the investment firms, the insurance firms, which had consciously uh, provided uh, loans that they knew were basically unpayable, uh, used complicated uh, financial devices, derivatives, and others to distribute the uh, the risk. Uh, uh, and when it all crashed, uh, then comes the legislation, one part of which was to bail out the perpetrators, the major financial institutions. The other part of the legislation was to offer some help to the victims, the people who had, had their homes foreclosed, who were out in the streets, didn't have jobs. That's the second part of the legislation. Well, guess which part was implemented? Uh, the first part. Uh, that's the masters in charge. Uh, uh, the uh, inspector general of the Treasury Department, Neil Borofsky, was so outraged by this, he wrote articles and even a book about it, but it didn't matter. That's the way state capitalism works, governed by the principles that were actually described by Adam Smith 250 years ago. No, taken slightly different forms, but the same principles. Can you um, talk about the ways that the media colludes in this ecosystem? The I think specifically the political class, I mean, the political theater, the political circus, and the media collude to create an artificial reality that you know, you have very famously spoken about as, you know, manufacturing consent to whatever happens. Well, the media are, uh, first of all, we should say that they're an indispensable way of finding out roughly what's going on in the world. First thing I do in the morning is read the national press. I know that it's distorted. I know how it's distorted, but nevertheless, it's the primary source of general information. But if you look at uh, the way that the media de and the political class generally, the intellectual world generally, the way they look at these things is through the framework of dominant ideology, which is largely established by the powerful institutions that own and run the society. So, you see this on every issue. So, for example, on uh, on the economic issue issues, they're not describing what I just what I just mentioned. They're not giving you Adam Smith's accurate portrayal of the way the state capitalist system works. On the international front, it's even it's much more dramatic. It's impossible to say that the United States committed a crime, uh, the worst crimes of the post-Second World, post-war period after the Second World War, are the U.S. destruction of Indochina, massive crime, uh, U.S. invasion this century, U.S. invasion of Iraq, of uh, brutal, vicious, uh, uh, Ill uh, criminal invasion which destroyed the country. You can't find any. We're coming up to the anniversaries of them now. 
50th anniversary of the formal end of the war in Vietnam, 20th anniversary of invading Iraq, you're going to hear plenty of rhetoric about how we made mistakes, benign intentions, but just made mistakes. Uh, Harvard University can run uh, a conference, a debate on whether the invasion of Iraq, Iraq was a humanitarian intervention. If we saw a debate at Moscow University as to whether the invasion of Ukraine was a humanitarian intervention, we'd crack up, crack up and ridicule. But when it happens here, we're very respectful. We think, oh, isn't that uh, significant for Harvard to raise this question? This is, uh, the ideology is so skewed towards uh, subordination to state power and private power that you just have grossly distorted uh, conceptions of the world. So, for example, the United States' commentators here are very surprised, uh, even appalled, that most of the world refuses to go along with us on uh, issue after issue. Uh, why? Because they're not subjected to our uh, highly distorted ideological system. Uh, they don't see the world the way we're instructed to by our ideological institutions. Uh, so yes, uh, the way it's put here is there's something wrong with the world. Well, actually there's something wrong with the way we look at the world in our narrow, constrained fashion. Uh, for the world, it's, uh, it, um, you take a look at poll, international polls, I regard the United States as the most dangerous country in the world for pretty good reasons. Uh, when people in the South, the global South, Latin America, Asia, Africa, when they hear us orating, uh, in the case of Ukraine, about how terrible it is that Russia violated international law and invaded another country, which is true, it is terrible, but they crack up and ridicule. Who are you to talk about that? That's what you do to us all the time. So get off your high horse and just tell the truth. In, in unintelligible here, people can't understand it. What's wrong with them? Uh, how can they dare to compare our invasion of Iraq with the Russian invasion of Ukraine? Well, easily. Can you um kind of... Uh encapsulate that sort of point or that sort of um, uh, idea that uh, the media manufactures consent for a certain kind of reality, because for a little background, I mean, especially in the social media era, we live in this era of fake people calling fake things, fake news and CNN will call things fake news. But then the, the reporting that they do is so distorted as to ultimately create outcomes themselves. I mean, and the, of, of course, if the media companies are owned by the corporations that are going to engineer things in their favor as well. The actual reporting, what a journalist does in the field, is generally quite accurate, often courageous, uh, but the way it's reshaped as it works through the filters that determine uh, media performance can give you a very skewed view of the world. Uh, what I described is a perfect example. The, it's unintelligible here that most of the world regards the U.S. invasion of Iraq as criminal aggression, which destroyed a country and set in motion uh, forces that uh, are tearing the whole region apart. Here, the most that can be said is, well, it was a regrettable mistake, strategic blunder. We uh, honor Barack Obama because he didn't go along with the invasion. He said it's a blunder. Do we honor the Russian generals who described the Russian invasion of Afghanistan as a blunder and then implemented it? No, we don't. But here, uh, the while well, the descriptions of what's happening on the ground are accurate, 
you can read reporters' accounts of the, here's a dramatic case, one of the major crimes of the United States in invading Iraq was the invasion of Fallujah, town of city of Fallujah, the twice second one was a real horror story. You look at the descriptions on the ground, they're accurate. They describe the horrors of the invasion. How is it interpreted here? If people ever even heard of it, it's just a, a marine uh, battle. In fact, the U.S. Navy has just commissioned its latest ship, an amphibious troop carrier called the USS Fallujah. Uh, the other countries honor their major atrocities uh, by naming major weapons after them. But here it passes without an eye blink, not in the world. You read the press in the global south, they were appalled by it. Kind of a simple, simple question I want to throw at you. Um, what is money and how does it control, connect and, and dictate reality? Take the major media. They're major corporations, parts of larger corporations, like other businesses, they sell a product to a market. The market they sell to is advertisers. That's their income source. That's other corporations. The product that they sell is you and me, uh, readers, viewers. Uh, these are sold by major corporations to other major corporations. Uh, furthermore, these Huge corporations are closely interrelated with government, both in personnel, people flow up and back from one to the other, but also in ideology and doctrine, They're part of the same large-scale doctrinal system. What do you expect to come from a structure like this? Just simple common sense suggests that the picture that will be presented will to some extent, reflect the interests of the sellers, the buyers, the institutions like the state that they're closely connected to. When you look in detail, that's exactly what you find. It's uh, considered a conspiracy theory or something like that. Whenever you attribute rationality to planners, it's called a conspiracy uh, if you say, well, they just made mistakes or they're stupid or something like that, that's fine. Now, this is all the time. I mean, take, say, the whole Cold War. Uh, you go back to the origins of the Cold War around 1950, uh, huge armament programs. Uh, uh, there are perfectly rational explanations, uh, which you find in the documentary record in the business press and so on all necessary to save the U.S. economy from recession, to make sure we controlled uh, Europe and Asia. Uh, when you spell all this out, it's a conspiracy theory. Uh, you say, look, they, it's perfectly clear that they knew that there was no major Russian threat, but concocted it to justify um, these actions. As Senator Vandenberg put it, we have to scare the hell out of the American people to ram this stuff through. And Dean Acheson, Secretary of State, he explained the almost hysterical tone of the documents he was supervising by saying, we have to be clearer than truth to bludgeon the mass mind of government to follow our policies. If you bring all this stuff up, it's conspiracy theory happens to be well documented, perfectly rational and reasonable, but it's not the kind of thing we're supposed to believe. We're supposed to say, oh, well, they were deluded, they didn't understand, you know, they really thought there were weapons of mass destruction in Iraq, um, so on and so forth. As long as you say that, it's fine. We don't do that with other countries, incidentally. We attribute to them rational planning. Can't do that to us. If you do it, it's dismissed as conspiracy theory and wild ideas and so on. It's a very well-controlled uh, and 
uh, uh, shaped uh, doctrinal system. People who try to uh, uh, depart from it are they're not put in concentration camps. It's free country, but they're marginalized, and, uh, vi uh, vilified, and so on. Like good old Noam Chomsky, freedom hater. <laughs> okay, I have two questions, two more questions for you, and then I think we'll bring on um, the others. Um, so I want to kind of preface this a little bit by just saying that you said, I think the other day in an interview, that we've never been in a more dangerous moment that things have never been closer to the abyss. You mentioned earlier that the, uh, the nuclear annihilation clock, and that's just one of our issues we face. Mass species extinction, climate change, soil erosion, supply chain collapse, the, the destruction of our energy grid, all of these things are bringing us toward an interconnected crisis. Um, all crises are converging into one, uh, and it seems that one way or another, unification of some kind is the only option is going to come. So can you issue in effect a warning to the human species about the predicament that it faces and the, the choices that we have in this moment? We have young people today are facing a challenge that has never arisen in human history. They have to decide, and quickly, whether we will move towards a precipice after which there will be no return, just steady decline to an unlivable world. One possible, that's on climate and environment, and whether we will continue to escalate tensions leading to a terminal nuclear war. Those are the questions that have to be asked. And unfortunately, the masters of mankind, as Adam Smith called them, the decisions they're making are driving us to disaster, both in destruction of the environment and escalation of a war that could easily turn into terminal nuclear war. That's happening in the case of Europe, Ukraine war, also in the case of China. Uh, U.S. policies in China are uh, uh, around, uh, containing uh, what they call uh, encircling China are uh, raising significantly the pro prospects of a major war, which of course will be terminal. So we are acting consciously, openly, not we, our leaders, consciously and openly in ways which are driving us towards destruction. Now, are younger people going to permit this? Just watch it, watch it as it happens? Or are they going to organize, educate, act to prevent it, which can be done? For every one of the problems we face, and they are severe, we do know answers feasible answers. Question is, do we have the will, the commitment, the dedication to see that those answers are carried out? That's a perfect setup or prelude to um, the sort of natural response to that question. And it's the question that if I had one question, you know, if I came up to you on the street or whatever, you know, I had one thing to ask you, it would be quite simply, you know, what is the answer? You know, because we have individual solutions to these issues uh, and individually we could cut them all up and say we have a energy solution we have a food solution we have all these things but it really it doesn't seem it, it is glaringly obvious at this point that we have a system problem the problem is capitalism we have we and we need to fight that with a vision that will run through every activist political social and even commercial every single arm of society needs to run through with a new system, a new vision for what can be, how we can reorganize human life. You have um, described yourself in the past as an anarchist. You have described yourself as an anarcho-syndicalist or spoken favorably of these sorts of systems. Do you feel that those uh, belief systems or those systems or um, methodologies are relevant or overall in your views and um, your prolific study and exploration of 
the many different possibilities that exist in the world. What is the synthesis? If you can sum that up, I know that's the essentially the, the body of the whole film that we're trying to make. But if you can speak to that new system, what is its candor? What is it like? And how do we sort of move toward it? Well, to put it simply, the system that we should be striving to attain is one in which people, the general population, can make the decisions that are significant for them in their lives and in their general attitude toward the world. We're very far from that. We have a formal political system, but it is by no means responsive to popular opinion. It's been demonstrated, it's perfectly obvious. It's also demonstrated in extensive political science research. Uh, the economic system in principle is dictatorial, fascist. Economic system is one in which you have private ownership. Uh, other individuals, you, you or I, have the choice of entering the job market in what's called to make a free contract. The worker and the capitalist enter into a free contract. For the worker, the choice is take the job or starve to death. For the capitalist, the choice is you take the job or I'll get somebody else. That's called a free contract. Well, what it means is servitude, uh, not freedom, not democracy. In the economic, political, and social realms, we should be looking for authentic democracy, participation of the population, in decisions that matter to them. That means a substantial change in the nature of their social, economic, and political structures. But the fact of the matter is, and we have to face this, that we are, that there are problems of extreme urgency that will be solved in the near future or we're finished. You can't delay the climate crisis. You can't delay the problem of nuclear wars, which means they have to be dealt with and overcome within basically the framework of existing institutions, which can be modified. Uh, their worst flaws can be mitigated. You can move towards a more regulated capitalist system, which isn't as suicidal as the present one. But there are, at the same time, you have to try to solve the immediate problems within basically existing structures while trying to change the structures so we can move on to a much better world in the future. These are parallel uh, interacting uh, commitments. Can you just speak to the hope um, of the other side of this? That it seems like you, you've been fighting not just the bad things, the horrors, the problems, but you've been fighting for something, for a better world. Can you speak to that um, with with a sense of hope? For be, be, real quick, because it it's it it seems <laughs> it seems like we we can't really solve these problems without restructuring reality and life in such a, a way that we do invalidate the structure of capitalism. We can't change our food, energy, production, movement systems all without making the world drastically better. So that's that's what motivates me. If you can speak to that real quick, then I'll bring on the others. The fact of the matter is we can mitigate control, overcome the worst of the, cri of the crises within a somewhat modified form of the existing basic institutional structures. That's feasible. In the longer term, we should move towards dismantling these illegitimate structures and constructing uh, ones that actually answer to the needs and the rights of the general population. Those two things are not inconsistent. They're mutually interacting. While we deal with the urgent crises in the current institutional framework, we are at the same time trying to bring out sharpen understanding of the suicidal nature of the institutions and moving to change them. These are, it's possible to have two ideas in mind that 
the same time and pursue both of them. Okay, so um, I'm going to invite my uh, colleagues here. Matt, you should go ahead and ask your, uh, your question, and Amanda will come in, and I'll. Uh... I suppose my main question, a lot of uh, a lot of other people, like has have kind of voiced this question as well, is, do you see um, a grassroots movement where we're kind of building an alternative to the current system, uh, like like Buckminster Fuller put it, you know, obsolete the current system by building a new system, um, or kind of going the standard political route uh, by trying to enact change via voting and political measures and things like that? Do you see them as both being equally effective or kind of one strategy being more effective than the other? Or would you would you advocate kind of just doing both essentially as, as to the best of our abilities? Or what's what's your view on grassroots movements where we're trying to create communities and build this real change versus going the political route? They're both essential. And there's no reason why you can't do both the I mean, there are decisions made in the political domain that are very significant. If we can influence them, we should. At the same time, we should be building institutions which reflect the just uh, commitments that we have towards a viable, uh, equitable world in which people control their own fate. So you can be working to build a cooperatives, uh, worker-owned enterprises, uh, localism in agriculture, in food production, and so on, at the same time that you're pressing Congress to pass legislation that will enable us to survive. Uh, it's not a matter of one or the other. You have to make judgments at each point about what's more important tomorrow, but both, both of these Parallel efforts have to be carried out constantly. Thank you. Wonderful answer. I appreciate that. Mm -hmm. uh, Amanda? It is such a pleasure to be asking you, of all people, this particular question. Uh, recently, I had been pondering the collective utility of language as we know it at this point in time in humanity's history. Uh, it seems we need to make a pivotal shift away from purely emotional and biased communication to a more technical-based communication. A lot of people would agree that technical communication is more conducive to reaching optimal outcomes. Now, given that and the fact that propagandists have successfully co-opted language to support the empire, the establishment, cultural and structural violence, systemic oppression, et al., uh, my burning question for the father of linguistics is, how do you perceive the future of linguistics to unfold? What might we be in store for when it uh, comes to social and interpersonal communications if we don't divert from the dystopian path we're on, which is rife of shallow and corrupt exchanges? Uh, the same path that is, of course, uh, leading the world to a premature and needless demise. Um, it's not an issue of uh, linguistic science. I don't have any more expertise on this issue than any person in the streets. This is all common sense. Uh, so yes, it's perfectly clear that language is constructed to mislead us. Uh, you don't talk about capitalist autocracy, you talk about free enterprise. You don't talk about profits, you talk about jobs, uh, which means uh, President says, uh, President Trump uh, passes uh, one legislation of his uh, administration, a huge uh, tax cut for the very rich. It's called a jobs program. Uh, yeah, of course you expect that. Uh, you don't talk about uh, U.S. aggression. You talk about U.S. humanitarian intervention, uh, all kinds of ways of distorting the way the world works. Okay. You don't need any profound understanding to see what's going on. Let's just talk straight, simple, straight, honest, uh, de uh, dismantle the illusions and so on. Uh, the illusions, incidentally, are perfectly conscious. Uh, the advertising industry spends billions of dollars a year trying to mislead you about such things. So does the 
uh, 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 media and intellectual system. Okay, decode them, talk honestly and straight about what's happening. Uh, the greatest, uh, uh, for some young person, the greatest aspiration in life is supposed to be to get a job. That is to be a serf, to be the slave to a master for your entire waking life. Isn't that wonderful? Okay, let's talk about it straight the way it is. Uh, working people were able to do that a century ago, so we should be able to now. And the same in every area of life. It's not profound. It's not quantum physics. It just requires a open, critical mind looking at the world around you. You have a job. What does it mean? It means for your waking life, you're following orders of a master beyond the level of anything that Stalin could have dreamt of. Stalin couldn't have told you you can have a five-minute uh, bathroom break at three o'clock. Uh, it couldn't have told you these are the clothes you have to wear. Uh, this is the path you have to take in an Amazon warehouse from here to here. If you don't do it, you get kicked down. And no uh, political dictator ever had that kind of control. It's what we call having a job. Okay, let's make it clear that that's what it is. Everyone sees it. As soon as you say it, it's obvious. You know, you don't have to write a complicated book about it. And this is true at every area. We invade another country. It's aggression, not a mistake. You know, not benign effort to help them to bring democracy. I just take it apart and uh, describe what's happening in simple words, not using the euphemisms and distortions that are used to avail the world and prevent us from seeing it. That's what activists and organizers should be doing and do do. If uh, um, I don't think it's very profound, it just takes an open, critical mind and a willing to dedicate yourself to deal with people with sympathy, understanding, um, help them see the world as it actually is in their own lives and in the world around them. Do you want to do something about all the issues we talk about here on our show? Do you want to learn more, get involved, and help us help others break out of the cycle? Step one is to join the growing community of rebels and kind hearts sharing their knowledge and passion. Follow Moneyless Society on our social media pages and spread the message to people who need it. When you're ready, you can get involved by reaching out and becoming a Moneyless Society volunteer. We need every skill imaginable, large or small, if we're going to resist the powers destroying our planet. And even if you don't have time to volunteer, you can help us build the dream with donations of any size. We create all of this community and content because it is our passion, but we need resources to get it done. Monthly Patreon donors receive cool perks like early access to future episodes, and visitors to our website, moneylesssociety.com, can buy Moso shirts and other merchandise that help spread awareness. We're glad you're here, and we hope that you'll keep learning and growing with us. The goal may seem far away, but we can get there together.